Hi, welcome to Street Priest Ministries. I'm your host, Brother Jay, as we're taking the Gospels back to the streets. Today's drive through message is Doubting Tongues. So turning your Bibles to John 11, 5. Now, I told you I'd get around the teaching on uh, Thomas, and I did. He's Thomas has inspired <clears throat> my ministry tremendously, you know, just like Paul. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, it'd be Jesus first, Paul second, and Thomas third. And the reason Thomas, because Thomas was a thinking man, and I can relate to him. You see, much of today's Christianity, I consider the short yellow bus Christianity, is what I call it. And those that got brains in their head got to get to the back of the bus. We're treated like second class citizens. And even and growing up and seeing the buffoonery I seen in the church world turned me off to it. It just wasn't logic. <clears throat> and uh, what got me started on my faith walk, as many of you know already, God gave me a personal tour of uh, Hellfire. That got me started. But still, I have this brain in my head that things have to make sense logical and God was gracious to me glory to God the highest for giving me the revelation that I've been seeking for just proof that I could find in science and archaeology in you know, history God's word through language he's proven his faithfulness to me like he did with Thomas. As Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I stick my fingers in, his, in your side and in, in, in the palm prints of your hand. And Christ submitted to the test. That's what most people don't realize. Not all of us can come to God the same way. And <clears throat> your experiences I can explain away as well as mine. It's psychological. So it takes more than that to really grip men and women that have brains in their head that think logically. And Thomas is, is definitely a hero, personal hero to me. And so we're going to start <clears throat> John 11, 5, 16. Now there's not much on Thomas or is in the record books. He was kind of quote. Thomas was like me. He didn't say a lot. He was laid back and observant. I'm that way. I'm like from the Missouri show me state. I can show you better than I can tell you. And Thomas was the same way. Um, obviously dealing with characters like Peter. <laughs> I'm sure Thomas had a few choice words. That's off the record for us regarding what he thought of him. I mean, Peter was just one of them guys. It would be hard for me to deal with a bit. I done dealt with Peters in my life. Ace, you know, I'm taught on that. Get that teaching on Peter to rise and fall and rise of Peter. But I done dealt with flying aces like him. Thomas and I are more laid back and calculating our moves. In the Peter type. Okay, so John eleven five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days, still in the same place where he was. So Christ heard he was sick and decided to kick back, lay back and wait instead of rushing to heal him. His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late, well then after that he said unto his disciples, Let us go to Judas again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late, sought to stone thee. 
and goest thou thither again? They say, you already almost died. And get put us at great risk going there the first time. Are you going to return to this city again? Jesus answered and said, Are not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Christ was the light of this world. Nobody could take his life. He said that many times. I laid out my life, I picked it up. They didn't understand that totally. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbled, because there is no light in him. These things saith he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. He's dead. Christ is being poetic. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. <laughs> then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. <laughs> if they can sleep, sleep. He sleep. Like you take a nap, sleep. Not dead. See how Christ is talking in circles even around him sometimes. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of a rest in his sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, <laughs> he came out. Jesus, Jesus was an enigmatic character. He was kind of opaque at times and spoke in dark sentences. But he at least kept it real with his disciples. <laughs> Everybody else around him was scratching their head. What did he mean? Then said Jesus unto them plainly, so you now you understand. Lazarus is dead, folks. Okay. And I am glad for your sakes. <laughs> that didn't come out right. The man's dead. He said, I'm glad for your sake. See, he's God in the flesh. Jehovah Pila, God of impossibilities. Nothing's impossible with him. You can't look at Christ in the natural. With natural lenses. That's what he was telling them back there. With You got the light with you. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe faith. In the time you hear believe, put faith. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So you seeing me raise him from the dead will cement your faith even more. Will rivet your faith, rivet your faith even more. Then said Thomas, which was Didymus, it's his surname, unto his fellow disciples. Now Thomas don't say much, but when he says something, it's a reality statement. Because he, he figured, hey, they, they tried to kill us the first time, they're going to do it again. This, this time they might succeed, so let's brace ourselves, fellas. Let us go, that we may die with him. <laughs> See, Thomas is a realist. He didn't pick up on that part where this is the Son of God. Nobody can take his life unless he lay it down. He's thinking, hey, we're going back. He's, you know, he's brave. He's willing to follow Christ to the death. But he's thinking logically. And I, so that's giving you a, a window into his character. He's a realist. All right. Let's look at another facet of Thomas here. John, uh, to turn to John 14, 1. John 14, 1. You got it? John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, Christ is obviously talking and referring to heaven. But let's see if Thomas figured that out. In my house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that ye may be also. Guys are going to heaven with me later, but I'm going to prepare. I have to, I have to die. Prepare, part of the preparation is dying for your sins. We're rising again. 
going back to eternity, which he did, ascended. And I'm building mansions for you. You're going to have your names written there. You guys are going to be superstars in heaven. Names are written on the 12 gates of heaven, like in Revelations. And I go and prepare a place for you, and will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And where I'm going, you know. You know where I'm going. Now, this is Jesus talking. He's telling them, you know where I'm going. The other was sat silent just looking. He is, and the way you know. See, you know where I'm going and the way you are. Thomas said unto him, Lord, I don't know where you're going. What do you mean where you're going? And how can I know the way? <laughs> he's being a realist. Tom, Thomas is being, he's thinking. He's a thinking man. He said, what do you mean? I don't know where you're going. And how, how can I find a way there? You don't know Christ is talking. He <laughs> talked about eternity. But in Thomas' mind, he's thinking natural. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one coming to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you, you know him and have seen him. I should keep reading. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it suffices us. It <laughs> will be satisfied if we see the Father too. Now all of a sudden, see Thomas, Thomasism started spreading. <laughs> and the rest of them want to see too. They said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Jesus said to them, Have I been so long time with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? All this time I have spent with you, you still ain't got it, that I'm the Son of God. He that have seen me have seen the Father. And how sayest thou, then show us the Father? <laughs> I'm the Son of God. I'm of the same essence, nature of God. You've seen me, you've seen, seen the Father now. Because we're one. And I ain't going to read any more, but you see Thomasism spread. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to turn to John 20. John 20, John 20, 24. Okay. Now Christ had been crucified and risen. And he appeared to the apostles. Thomas wasn't there. So then the apostles told him, hey, we've seen Christ. He's, he's back for the dead. And Thomas, <laughs> Thomas said, no way. Thomas said, no way, Jose. I ain't going to believe until I put my finger in his side and the palms of the head that he's, he's risen from the dead. I'm not going to believe but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. That's what we pick it up. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. <laughs> but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands and the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand to his side, I will not believe. Thomas was a pragmatist. He was a realist. He was a thinking man. He was a man of logic. You couldn't just tell him anything. And that's the problem with us and faith. Faith is the hardest thing for us type of guys. But once we're convinced, we're also the most dogged pursuant of truth and the, and dispensing the truth that you could ever get out of any of those guys there. That's once we're converted, you can't shake our faith. But it comes through much pain and hard head dogged study. 
and prove. And once we convince, that's with me. Once God convinced me, ain't nothing you could tell me. Nothing. That God doesn't keep his word. He's unproven it time and time and time again with me, lead me into all areas of truth, archaeology, science, history, paleontology. I am totally convinced. Theology, etymology. I am totally convinced God is sitting up there on his throne and what he said is the absolute unadulterated truth. He just, he's unproven that to me. Like I said, experiences can be explained away. I didn't have those. I didn't conducted miracles, seen miracles. The devil can do that kind of stuff too. So if your faith ain't to be based on that. But Thomas based his faith on the resurrection. Paul said, if Christ didn't rise from that tomb, we're all false witnesses of God. And we're wasting our time, Paul said. I studied the resurrection. I absolutely believe he came from that tomb. Without the resurrection, all the rest of this is hocus pocus. It's, it's, it's wasting my time. On one of my social media sites, I have an excellent expose on the resurrection. On one of my media sites. An atheist started out to disprove God is always a guy I can't remember. You can get to his book too. Who removed the stone? Been years since I wrote it, but that that part that partially, and what made mainly convinced me, because he came from an attorney. He was an attorney. The other guy was an was an objective reporter, a real reporter, not the fake news media guy, a real journalist uh, with a degree from a real college. <laughs> So people like us do research. You can't just tell us anything. Because we're going to look it up. It's what we do. And this guy wrote a great expose on proof of the on proof of, of the resurrection. It's like if you would go into a courtroom. Same with the guy who removed the stone. The attorney that was an atheist that started out to disprove Christianity. Because who needs it? If Christ didn't... If, if, Christianity is based on the, the whole crux of it, on the resurrection. Did he come forth from that tomb? Was it the guy who said, made all these claims, that was crucified? And one thing, you can't fake a Roman crucifixion. And Romans kept accurate records of capital punishment. So you start there. Was he, did, did Christ exist? You could do it just like you in the courtroom. Did he exist? That could be proven. That could be uh, trace. Was his parents who they were? Did they're witnesses? Veracity of witnesses, just like you were in the courtroom. There was record of Jesus. Jesus had to pay a stranger's tax because he was with his uncle, traveling the earth, who was a tin merchant for eighteen years. It's proof of Jesus from Glastonbury to India. His uncle was rich, tin mine. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of uh, Arimathea. It's a book written to traditions of Glastonbury. Proved that. But when he came back, the point I'm making, he had to pay a stranger's tax because he was gone for 18 years, from 12 to, th to 30. And he told Peter to go fetch the money, go whistle to a fish, and the fish would... Uh, pull up and spit out some gold to pay his tax. <laughs> it's true. But the point I'm making, you could study the resurrection for yourself. Like I say, I have it on my social media saying you will become convinced with the preponderance of evidence that Christ 
He really lived. He really existed. He died, the same guy. He was definitely crucified. The Romans verified that. And he had witnesses that he rose from that, that tomb. And they preached him. All these guys died horrible deaths. So if it was if it was fraud and staged, you don't die for for a concocted story. And it, and rarely do a concocted story make you a better person. All these disciples all have personality flaws. You see them totally opposite. You see Peter from going Peter from changing from an unstable, impecuous, flippant person to a rock, to stead. You see, James and John, the, the sons of thunder. John became the epitome of love. He wanted the, Christ to rain fire like Elijah down on the, the Roman dogs, the enemies. And they died. He became the epitome of love. So for a lie, even if you would just look at the characters, these guys all died horrible deaths with the exception of John. He died a peaceful death on the Isle of Patmos, around 100 years old. But all the, the disciples, you don't pay that kind of price for a lie. So if this was a lie, and all these guys died apart, they were all spread all over the then world. They were alone. It wasn't like you have telephones and hey, hey, you, hey, you, somebody would have to break rank and say, hey, it's all a hoax, folks. Psychologically, that's impossible to believe that all of them would die alone, apart, in different parts of the world, way away from each other, no contact, for a lie. Plus, there was 500 witnesses to seen Christ and sin into glory after his resurrection. It's too, it's too much. That's why the Pharisees start persecuting to killing the Christians to try to shut them down. Because of all the witnesses. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto him, Except I shall put my hands in the print of his nails and put my fingers in the print of his nails and to thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were with him and Thomas was with them. They were together again. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst of them. Well, if the doors were shut, obviously Jesus walked through the doors. <laughs> he didn't open the door. That's, that little part most people don't even pick up on. <laughs> he just walked right through the door. Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas. He went right for the doubter. Then said he to Thomas. Reach, reach hither thy finger. Put forth your finger. And behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand. And thrust it into my side. And be not faithless but believing. So don't doubt that I'm not standing here when you do this. Have faith that I resurrected, like I said I would. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me. But he did provide proof, and Christ did with me as well. And he did with a lot with other people. They just You can't just tell them simply to believe. He submitted to the Thomas test, the point I'm making. And the test was the resurrection. That's the veracity of God's word. Did he come forth from that tomb? Was it the person he said he was? The son of God? If so, we all need to bow to him. And order our life around him. And Thomas did. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Remember the word faith, faith. Call cross, believe thou, put faith. An action word. And many other signs truly did Jesus do in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written 
that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that fading ye might have life through his name. So I hope this inspires you, this teaching on Thomas, to faith in Christ. Thank God for Thomas and his doubt, doubting Thomas. Because it's helped a lot of us doubters that just can't simply believe like the others can. But God will submit. He submitted to my test and hopefully if you follow street priests, all your answers will be answered through the teaching that God has gifted me to do. And your questions will be quashed. And you too will start fading in God's word, all you doubters. I represent the doubters. I'm one. I'm right in line behind Doubt and Thomas. So God has convinced me, and I hope God utilizes me to convince you. Now, if I am convincing you and you've been taught by me, you owe. Bring your tithes, first fruits, alabaster box, the street priest ministry .org. Hit that donate button. Good day, good night, good evening to you around the world. May you grow in faith in Jesus' name.